Uh, I, I propose to divide my talk into four bits so that there's sort of little gaps which anyone that wants to say something or ask some questions or pipe up can, can, can do so. First of all, I want to examine the concept of education. Second, look at different views of what the world may be like in the year 2050. Uh, the point about 2050 being that five-year-olds going to school this year um, will be in the prime of life, we might expect, at 40. Um, in the year 2050. Um, thirdly, I want to suggest what education should be or could be preparing um, young people for, for that future. And finally, I thought I ought to look at the implications for teacher education of what I'm going to say. So, first of all, what is education? And I'm sure you've all written essays on this and so we'll say, what's he got to add to it? Well, let's try. Um, the Queen's speech this morning, oh, how's that for being up to date, um, to Parliament, said that um, her government would be improving education. So I'm sure that's good news for all of us. Um, the worry, I think, is that politicians have such a limited view of what education is. Um, they, uh, in the phrase I've used on a number of occasions, they, they tend to see uh, what I call the factory model of education, which teachers are seen as technicians um, uh, in pupil factories, they're given a government manual of what to do, they're regularly inspected and pupils are tested to ensure that there is efficiency and to try to measure progress. And I, I find this factory model, as I'd call it, totally unacceptable. Um, I don't know if any of you look at the, the uh, um, on the Guardian's website uh, something by, uh, that's written from time to time by uh, different people under the pseudonym of the secret teacher. And um, let me read this bit that came on the secret teacher website um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. The drive to hit targets is putting primary pupils under too much pressure. All SATs really teach them is that school is a chore. My year six class, and I'm sure every year six child across the land, have been learning, and yes, they have made progress, lots of it for some, uh, but we know this because we've measured their strict diet, uh, test, drill, repeat twice every half term for the entire year, the issue here is whether it was worth it, because in so many respects, the drive for floor targets and pupil premium percentage increases have robbed students of their primary school experience. The regime is focused on spelling and grammar, reading, comprehensions, mental maths, combined with extra practice tests, interventions and booster clubs fitted in anywhere between dusk and dawn. And children can hardly remember what an art book looks like or what a decent PE lesson feels like or what a music lesson could be. They're so confined to their desks that the process of developing the whole child has gone out of the window and their actual interests and other skills no longer have a place in school life. Before I go any further, is this machine working right? I'm not reverberating around the room, am I? I'm okay, am I? Good, good, good. Well, yeah, I was going to say, wow, but I missed my cue, didn't I, <laughs> uh, on looking at what the, the, this teacher has recently written. Um, because what one can ask is, how does the government justify what is actually happening? And uh, it's interesting to see what Nicky Morgan, who was now uh, again uh, to be Secretary of State for Education, what she said last November, she said, other nations outside of the West are seeing their skills base and economies accelerate at an unprecedented rate. Now more than ever, we need to ensure that more of our young people are leaving education, not just with the skills to succeed in modern Britain, but to compete in an increasingly global economy. So, Competing in the future global economy is the justification for putting pressure on primary schools to improve SATS results and on secondary schools for better GCSE results in a narrow range, a narrowing range of subjects. But is this right? I shall argue that it is the global ecology and not the global economy that should matter and not of today 
but of the times when today's children are adults. And so, to repeat my opening question, what is education, or perhaps what should it be, or what could it be? It may sound pedantic, but I argue that anyone who aims to talk or plan constructively about schools should first make very clear what they understand by the word education. And so, now you get my take on it. The great purpose of education is to enable individual citizens to be capable of thinking for themselves, moral beings well equipped with the many and varied attributes that they learn in their years of schooling, and able to continue to develop and learn purposefully throughout their lives in a contented pursuit of worthwhile life, liberty and happiness. A young lady that comes to my house and helps clean my house told me the other day that when you're using an overhead projector, you shouldn't read it from the screen. You should read it beforehand and then shove it up there. So that's the way I'm doing it today. Incident, the very first line of this, the great purpose of education is to enable individual citizens to be capable of thinking for themselves, was a statement that in 1945 appeared in the Labour Party's manifesto. I've just, you know, cheekily developed it a bit further, as you can see. So, what should be the components of education in today's world? And I have long thought that there were three parts to this. Education should support the experience and nurture of personal and social development towards worthwhile living, should provide abundant opportunities for the acquisition and discovery of worthwhile culture, and develop worthwhile survival skills for a warming, resource-depleted, chaotic, angry world. And then we'll shove this up on the screen bit by bit, um, like that and like that. <coughs> It follows from these skeleton statements that educational debate should focus on what is worthwhile. That's a word that I keep using. So, what is worthwhile in education? And I think we could all make our long list of this, but since I'm up here and you're sitting that side, you can get my list. There are 11 things that, that at the moment, I think, education sort of does entail as being worthwhile. It's learning how to relate to others peacefully and with mutual respect. There's learning, obviously, learning the skills of reading, writing, speaking, listening, thinking, debating, as well as mathematical skills. There's developing natural talents for creative art, writing, drawing, painting, dancing, making music. There's learning a healthy use of one's own body through diet, exercise and sport. There's learning to respect the natural world. And then beginning to learn of the cultural wealth that one can spend one's life enjoying under headings like science, history, geography, literature, philosophy, art, music, languages, and much else, of course. There's becoming a moral citizen with ethical standards and a commitment to community. There's finding how to collaborate and when to compete, when to be tolerant, when to be assertive, when to stand up for one's rights. It's learning how to go on learning for the rest of one's life and to expect to find the pleasure of it. Learning to know and to value oneself. And at the end of my list is, through all of this, preparing oneself for the world of work, home and leisure. So to me, these are ideas that define what schools and the work of teachers are hopefully about. Uh, I just fear that in the present climate, the political climate, um, people are rather trammeled in what they're trying to do. And so it follows from this, of course, that teachers should be well-educated, strongly committed people who are trusted by society. And I think we may, should make a lot of this that teachers need, and indeed, uh, in most cases, I'm sure are trusted by society. Um, but in addition uh, to being well educated, teachers need to be professionally trained so that their commitment is focused on handling the characteristics and development paths of young people. And sadly, of course, the present government says that professional training isn't really needed in order to, to go into a school and teach. In all of this, schools should be joyful places 
as they go about the business of preparing young people for the good life in terms of work, play and home. Our teachers, obviously, should be warm-hearted, professional firebrands, uh, inspiring the young. As philosophers have said since the time of the ancient Greeks, uh, teachers should be lighting fires and not filling buckets. And I fear many of our politicians do not understand this, since I'm afraid they measure the success of schools so often in terms of SAT results at 11, uh, GCSE results 16, and the number of entrants to university at 18 plus. One further point I'd like to make um, uh, is that I think we should recognize a distinction between primary and secondary and tertiary education that sometimes gets obscured, and I would put it in these terms. <coughs> It is self-evident, but I think uh, I, I won't develop the argument fully at the moment, but um, I, I think there are major distinctions between the way that primary education is and should be conducted and secondary education, and so to, to, to try to see a seamless development, for example, in terms of national curriculum, seems to me to be rather, rather unwise. Well, I said I would stop for a few minutes, so would anyone like to say, well, that's a load of rubbish you've said there, or agree with it, or challenge me, or any, any points anyone would like to raise? Has anyone experience of, of the sort of things that the secret teacher was talking about, or seen it in, in classrooms that you visited? Nodding ahead, yes, thank you. <laughs> It is always nice in an audience, you know, if someone actually grins at you or nods their head. Thank you. Um, I wonder whether you would agree that primary education and secondary education are different in major ways and should not be treated as education like this in the way that politicians tend to. Um, I think that there is a very big divide and whereas I think that the secondary schools are, are focusing obviously on working people towards the sort of leaving school and going through academic subjects. I think trying to teach these academic subjects in primary schools is, is problematic. I think it's, you know, it, 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 it's demanding things. You're going to say something, please. Um, I would argue that um, primary schools need to be small so that young children are not overwhelmed by numbers, um, with every teacher knowing by name every child, giving the, the sense of community in it, and so that the head can be effective as the educational leader of the school because uh, of the stage of development that young people are at. And the emotional uh, and social development is as important as many other aspects of their work. Not, notwithstanding, I mean, obviously, sort of reading, writing, and the rest of it is important. But um, by contrast, secondary schools, you know, do seem to be um, uh, engaged in teaching a range of academic disciplines, which um, doesn't. No, the, uh, no. As a teacher, you meet perhaps 200 or more kids in a week. And you can't know them to the extent that a primary teacher can. And a primary teacher is, you know, is then aware of, of the development um, day by day sometimes uh, of children. So I think this is, it is part of the distinction that I would draw if I were developing the argument. Can I move on? Um, we, we come now to the, the nitty-gritty of what we're saying, because I'm sure you've said, oh, well, amen to what I've said so far. But now I want to look at life in the year 2050. I've said governments tend to focus on perhaps you know, five years, ten years of, in their policies. Um, the Department of Education does seem to plan a little bit further on, but my worry is that they see the future as an extrapolation of the economic present with nations competing for markets for their goods and services, struggling to promote economic growth and needing a technically skilled workforce to engage in this global competition. And that's what we're being told all the time at the moment is needed. But will the future be like that? Um, teachers need to focus on the next 50 years, not, not the next five years. 
Let's ask what the world will look like when today's five-year-olds are 40, as I said earlier. Um, if you Google year 2050 predictions, a long list comes up. Um, and, uh, the, the time I did it, I know, I know it varies, you know, when you Google tomorrow, it's different to, to, to yesterday's Google. But nearly half of the Amazon forests have been deforested by the year 2050. Wildfires have tripled in some regions. Traditional wine industries have been severely altered by climate change. Fish body size has declined by nearly a quarter. Um, High-tech intelligent buildings are revolutionizing the urban landscape. Automobiles are smaller, safer and high-tech and may be driven by themselves. Well, I, I'm sure it won't be just the wine industries that are affected by climate change. Um, to me, the most significant report of recent years came from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, shortened to IPCC. Oh, I forgot this one. I should have shown you that earlier. Oh, let's have a look at that. I trust you can all read the French. <laughs> so, what I wanted to look at was the climate change uh, uh, report which produced by um, a, 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 a panel supported by literally thousands of scientists worldwide. Um, uh, the, the IPCC is described as, uh, described itself as a scientific body under the auspices of the United Nations. It reviews and assesses the most recent scientific, technical and socio-economic information produced worldwide relevant to the understanding of climate change. Thousands of scientists from all over the world contribute to the work and so on. Well, what do the world scientists say? And this is taken from this report, the, the Climate Change Synthesis Report, as it's called. Human influence on the climate system is clear. Recent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. Warming of the climate system is unequivocal, the atmosphere and ocean have warmed. And here we get them. Now, it's, it's a complicated report, and I'm just going to show one, uh, one graph from it. Um, the um, anthropogenic, I always find a job with pronouncing that word, of greenhouse gases emissions. And I, I take it people understand the concept of greenhouse gases. You know, that the sun's radiation comes to Earth, warms up the Earth, and the Earth emits radiation at, at, at a lower wavelength, which gets absorbed if there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and warms up the atmosphere. And in, in this graph, the, the, the bottom one is the uh, carbon dioxide coming from fossil fuels and industrial processes. And you can see that from 1970 to 2010, um, it had virtually doubled, whereas other of the greenhouse gases are slightly increasing, but not to any great extent. But, and this one, of course, is going to increase and increase and increase until something happens to stop it. I don't know if any of you have seen the, um, in the papers today that India is opening a large number of coal mines because it desperately needs to burn coal to provide energy for its people, but is also liberating a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The IPCC makes these dire predictions for the year 2050. Temperatures are expected to rise from somewhere between 0.8 and more than 2 degrees Celsius by the year 2050. More than 1 million species of plants and animals worldwide are projected to be extinct. And the ocean waters are projected to rise 1 to 4 feet, threatening the homes of 25 million to 40 million people. If you think of the oceans, it's pretty obvious that water expands when it's warmed and um, if the oceans are warmed, then they rise and then there are coastal problems for lots of countries. Um, the Guardian recently reported someone saying that already in Bangladesh, 50,000 people migrate to the capital city every month because rising sea level have made these villages uninhabitable and they have destroyed their 
arable land. So the IPCC is, is clear that we humans are responsible for this and that by 2050 there will of course be more of us on planet Earth. According to the United States Census Bureau, the world population will grow from a present 7.4 billion to 9.1 billion in 2050. I find an alarming feature of all of this um, is that the combined judgments, as I say, of thousands of scientists are denied by some very influential people. Um, if you Google global warming denials, you, you learn quite a bit about it. You find that between the years 2002 and 2010, nearly $120 million were anonymously uh, donated, some by conservative billionaires, to more than 100 organizations seeking to cast doubt on the science behind climate change. The fossil fuel companies with enormous investment in oil, gas uh, and coal are prominent deniers um, that mankind burning fuel is responsible. Recently, Shell has been beginning to suggest it might begin to change what it's engaged in, but it's on a long-term scenario. It's not going to be in the next 30 or 40 years. And sadly, the Daily Mail and Rupert Murdoch are also deniers. They deny the existence of man-made global warming. And so, unfortunately, a high proportion of the newspaper reading public is led to have doubts about what, what, I, what I'm saying this afternoon. Apart from temperature increases, there are other problems. Water shortage being a prominent one. A report in the proceedings of the United States National Academy of Sciences says more than one billion urban residents will face serious water shortages by 2050 as climate change worsens the effects of urbanization, with Indian cities, citizens in particular among the worst hit. The shortage will threaten sanitation in some of the world's fastest growing cities. Well, various writers have speculated uh, uh, about the future, and uh, it, it's worth looking at one or two of these. Um, this is a cover of a book by a man called Ulrich Ebert, which, how we invent the future today and what life will be like in the year 2050. Um, he's reasonably optimistic. He says, um, we will get sufficient energy from non-fossil fuel sources. And he said, by 2050, power plants to desert, re to desert regions like the Sahara and the Mojave Desert in the United States will generate electricity for nearby towns and cities. Wind power, in addition to solar power, hydrogen and biomass, will have replaced petrol and based products as sources of energy. Well, I hope that could be the case. He also has some curious ideas. He says, computers will act as medical assistants, robots will become household servants to the higher class as well as the middle class, electric cars will have sensors enabling driverless control, traffic lights and stop signs will become redundant. And then he goes on to say that vertical farming on buildings um, will allow farms to grow up the wall and trends in business, science and politics will lead to breathtaking innovations which we cannot imagine. Well, some go further th than this man, Ebel. There's a, uh, a website called businessinsider.com. It says, in the coming decades, some scientists hope to upload the contents of human brains into computers, allowing people to live forever inside a robotic body or even a hologram. Neuroscientist Randall Kern is trying to transfer human consciousness and brain functions to an artificial body by 2045. Other scientists are working on preserving human brains and all their contents uh, indefinitely for immersion in various chemical solutions. I find it very a bit bizarre. <coughs> 
But Atal, Atali is eventually optimistic, for he foresees what he calls planetary democracy. And he says this will limit the power of markets and fight against what we, he refers to as the madness of men, of climatic upheaval, of mortal disease, alienation and poverty. It's a tough book. But it's the sort of book that I think teachers should read, among the many other things that there are to read, in order to, to have some sense of what the, the people that, that, that we teach uh, will experience in their later lives. Um, there's a, a man called Lawrence Smith. Oh, no, this was one that I meant to show you earlier. Uh, this is vegetation growing on a multi-story building. You, know, you can imagine sort of coming and picking your beans and your peas off the side of the building. Uh, I'm staying at the moment in a jury, uh, jury's inn in, in Brighton, and all the buildings round, uh, I noticed one of them even has got a roof that's greened all over. So whether somebody comes and mows the grass or not, I'm not sure. Um, Lawrence Smith, in the, the book that I want to look at next, oh no, I've forgotten this one. Uh, how about this for a bit of lunacy? This is the idea of Mars settlements on 2065. No, there are people around that, in my terms, are crazy thinking uh, of this sort of development. This is what I was trying to get to. Um, oh, that's uh, the book I've just referred to. This is another book, The World in 2050, a man called Lawrence Smith. And he asks the question, what kind of a world do we want? And he examines the global forces of population growth, resource depletion, economic globalisation and climate change. And this, again, is, is a tough book. <laughs> One more book I want to refer to. Um, it's based not on speculation, but on evidence from the past. It is based on the fossil record. A woman called um, Elizabeth Colbert has this book called The Sixth Extinction. She writes meticulously uh, about the graptolites, the trilobites, the echinoderms, the mastodons, the great orcs, the ammonites, and the many kinds of dinosaurs who did not survive the various catastrophic global events known as extinctions. And you can guess what she is uh, implying there. I rather like this cartoon. I don't know whether you can read it. As the hot air rose, and with it global temperatures and water levels, the little mermaid thought, oh bugger, and drowned. <laughs> what I want to move on to is the question of rethinking education. Um, I, I pose this question, what kind of a world do we want? Uh, but it invites all sorts of answers. But really a more pertinent question, what kind of a world will it be? Uh, what will England be like in, say, 2050? Well, uh, as I, I've, I've argued, there's little doubt that earth, will, or earth warming will have continued, even if we have successfully sealed off, uh, if we have sealed off the source of coal, oil and gas, to produce greenhouse gases, because it is a cumulative thing and it's sort of uh, inevitably the, the, the temperature will rise. Um, so there will be major droughts. Um, devastating storms affecting us, us as a country and of course all around the world and in some places uh, probably much worse than we will experience in England. But you know trees will be torn down, roofs will be lifted, homes damaged, um, sea surges will flood low level, um, low level land uh, uh, certainly along our coasts and of course some of this is already happening now and we no, I think we ignore it at our peril. At present, 60% of the food that we consume in the UK is homegrown. But with warmer and wetter winters and with drier summers, this will be at risk. Um, one reason being significant changes in pests, diseases, weeds, which affect our agricultural production. And as I said earlier, maybe our wine industry will improve. Uh, but other important crops may not do so. Um, likewise, the 40% of our food that we import at present from other countries will be affected because of the uh, problems that they have. And so I, I, I envisage a time when it becomes necessary for us to move towards self-sufficiency in food production 
and we adapt our agriculture to a changing climate. And okay, I agree, we probably can't grow bananas, but many other crops, certainly, we could be self-sufficient. As a nation, we'll be ready for a time of adversity. And here, sort of just anecdotally, um, being in my 80s, I look back to my childhood during the war, the Second World War. My family lived in Orpington in Kent, a few miles south of London. Uh, the devastation then came from bombs. Um, some of the time we slept in air raid shelters. Every day I carried a gas mask to school. But it's not the horrors of that time that I remember, but the way that people pulled together. They supported each other and, as part of the war effort, opened up allotments on wasteland and, and grew vegetables to feed themselves. I remember my father proudly pushing a wheelbarrow home, a pile of potatoes and carrots and cauliflowers and so on, a big marrow, I remember, um, that he brought home that he'd grown on the allotment. And the other one is that walking home from school, if there was an air raid warning, the instruction given to us was go into the nearest house and say, can I come in your air raid shelter? And it's interesting because there was no discussion then of stranger danger. <laughs> no, people were expecting sort of to cooperate and support each other. And there, there was a lot of that. Well, I fear that today fewer folk are community minded. A recent research reported on, uh, I think it was on ITV's Tonight program, revealed that more than half of the people that were interviewed did not know the people living next door to them. So this sense of neighbourlessness, which is sort of prominent in some areas, in others just isn't there. In anger, I consider that this has been encouraged in schools by successive governments. Um, governments of both left and right, um, ever since the Education Reform Act of 1988, because the constant testing of young people makes them and their parents increasingly competitive and it promotes this me-first culture. League tables do the same with the myth that one school is better than another and so my child should go to that school because it's better than that one. When we hear of parents moving home to be in a locality of a particular school because it is judged the best, we realise just how far society has moved in the competitive stakes. I believe there are few teachers that actually want this state of affairs and within their own classrooms, I am sure um, virtually all teachers treat all their pupils as equally deserving. But they are of course aware of the external pr pr uh, pressures demanding competition. Parents who are obsessed with getting their children to the best school don't seem to realise that in terms of primary education, it is the calibre and personality of the individual teacher that matters, hardly the image and test results of the school. And if we can accept Ofsted judgments, which I often <laughs> would challenge, but if we accept them, the current state of play is that 81% of primary schools have been judged to be good or outstanding. So why do parents get so fussed? And I think there are good reasons for children, young children particularly, going to the local school. What should schools do to prepare young people for life in the mid-century? Mid let's stay with present structures, with young people in school divided into classes, primary schools having class teachers, secondary schools subject teachers. I hope that soon, Today's instruments of government control, excessive testing, league tables, benchmarks, floor standards, performance management, a detailed national curriculum, and even Ofsted inspections will be swept away. Will be swept away, that, that's what I looked for. I hope that the pernicious Whitehall-based micromanagement of recent years will stop. And in their place, I look for a local or regional structure that coordinates the links between schools and small teams of local inspectors come advisors who offer challenge and support to schools in the way that the best local education authorities did provide in the mid 20th century. And I stress the best because some of the, the local authorities were very poor but others were brilliant 
and yet they, they have been knocked sideways by, by central government. But fundamentally, I want to ensure that society trusts teachers. Um, so I, I, I expect and hope that teachers can work increasingly collegially within their schools, meaning that they share ideas, support each other. And I hope that schools will, are able to cooperate with neighbouring schools rather than see themselves in competition with neighbours. I hope teachers will interact with their local communities in devising curricula for their pupils based on simple and minimal national guidelines drawn up by a national education council. And I want such a council to be set up, funded by government, but independent of government, composed of teachers, parents, academics, public figures, and so on, and with the task of offering guidance to schools, but not edicts. In particular, I hope that parents and the nation recognise that they can trust teachers to do their best for every child and young person without the controls and sanctions that exist today. So let's, let's consider, first of all, what primary schools could do. Um, I don't know if any of you have met it, I expect some of you have. Um, at Lambeth, um, teachers in Lambeth produced what they called a primary school charter. In less than 700 words, they give a very clear vision of how the present shackles that constrain primary education should be replaced by a child-centred, player-oriented, community-focused education based on democratic values. It provides an excellent and, in my view, sufficient baseline for any discussion of what primary education should entail. Incidentally, I was looking at the, the, the present statement of the national curriculum. I was amazed to read that teachers should teach um, young children to run. <laughs> can't believe it. You know, what sort of lunatic wrote a statement <laughs> like that? Well, this is the, Lam the, the Lambeth Primary School chart. I'm going to leave you to read it. I think that a statement as simple as this is the right starting point for teachers in a primary school, led by their head, to design their own school curriculum in the context of the children of the school and the physical and human resources available, and in discussion with members of the local community. But also, I would want it discussed in terms of coming climate change. I think the most important aspect of this for primary schools is in terms of community development. As was the case up to the 1990s, young people should attend their local schools and their school work should be collaborative. Young children should walk to school. This contributes to their health and also to community development. Attending the local school means that their school friends can also be home friends with whom they can play in their home locality. And their parents will meet at the school gates and like their children, can then build local friendships. Community matters since when adversity strikes, the stronger the community, the more people will be prepared to support each other. So out-of-door activities like exploring nature, hiking, camping, should be important ways of encouraging children to work together, individually to be resilient and to gain awareness of the beauty and the dangers of the natural world. When we come to secondary education, it's more difficult to envisage major change. I can't see it happening in the near future, but I would want to abolish GCSE and A-level and have, at the very end of schooling, at 18 or 19, as it has now become, diploma assessments providing routes into apprenticeship, university or work. And up to that time, I would want all of the testing to be internal testing, you no, know, by teachers working uh, um, to their own lights, rather than external things that are, can be published in newspapers and all the rest of the rubbish of it. I doubt whether the traditional academic subjects deserve the preeminence they get in the secondary school curriculum. Most of us in this room have found much pleasure, I expect, 
in learning history or geography or literature or one or two of the sciences or the social sciences or languages or music or art or drama. But whether these have the fascination for all young people in our schools is questionable. How many youngsters actually learn little more than coping with boredom? The Association of Teachers and Lecturers um, in 2009 published a booklet called Subject to Change, New Thinking on the Curriculum, which interestingly advocates a skilled-based curriculum focused on communication, physical, interpersonal thinking and learning skills, which the author saw as essential to the educated person of the 21st century. And about the same time, Professor Richard Pring of Oxford led a massive rethink of secondary education um, in the Nuffield Review of 14 to 19 Education, and it based its ideas on five principles. These studies are not throwing out academic subjects, but they're challenging their dominance in the curriculum. In terms of coming climate change, I want 16 to 19 year olds to spend as much school time working in the local community as they do in the classroom or apprentice workshops. I envisage student-led or teacher-led teams supporting elderly people in their community, helping young children with a reading in primary schools, growing vegetables, tending livestock, providing street theatre, enhancing local environments, erecting solar panels, planting trees, and through such teamwork, learning democratic values and an ethos of harmony, cooperation, stewardship, self-sufficiency, and self-worth. That's not throwing out all the academic subjects. It's saying that part of the time, at least, should be spent on these, what I would call sort of community-directed, activities. Well, would you agree? In my book, um, Education for the Inevitable, I've suggested a number of substantial changes. I envisage all teachers in, in training having a, an 18-month postgraduate course, 18 months, and I'll explain why in a moment, following a first degree. Um, after graduation from a degree, I would want people to spend at least six months wandering around the country or the world or Europe or what, but doing something other than being sort of in the classroom all the time. And, I mean, a year isn't long, uh, half a year isn't long enough, should be longer than that, but let's at least settle for sort of six months when, you know, people get on a bike and travel off somewhere or, or whatever. I'm trying to sort of see it in bicycles <laughs> rather than in aeroplanes, if you like, but, but uh, travel, I think, is... Or, or working maybe in a factory or working on a farm or, or something like that, but doing something entirely different from what's happened before. And uh, the importance of this, of course, is to experience some... Get, gain some experience of the world outside school and college. Um, now, then, obviously, postgraduate students should spend at least half of their course working in a variety of schools um, under the guidance of both college tutors and school teachers learning sort of or what's, what's about. In college work uh, should entail a, a strong element, obviously, of pedagogic theory, covering a range of subjects for intending primary teachers and uh, on the degree subject for intending secondary teachers. Plus, for everyone, of course, a detailed focus on reading, writing, listening, speaking, talking. Uh, there should be a good grounding in educational theory and uh, uh, particularly on child development. And uh, as I understand it at the moment, courses don't actually have enough time for some of these, uh, the, the, these obvious aspects of teacher education to be, be thoroughly developed. But there's one more element that I want, and you're probably sort of guessing where I'm moving to. I want theoretical and practical work on what I would call environmental futures. I want education for creating sustainable living. And this is why I think the course needs 18 months long. 
Certainly there must be sort of seminars on a range of books like, you know, Schumacher's Simone's Beautiful or The Club of Rome or Illig's Tools for Conviviality, Wilkinson Pickett's The Spirit Level and so on, books like this. Perhaps some of the books I've referred to here. But in practical terms, I want students on a postgraduate course to do something quite novel. I want everyone in January to be given a plot of land and some garden tools and some seeds and grow some food which could, no, could, could, could serve a family or something like that. No, six months round, sort of planting, tilling the land, growing it, and feeling this sort of, the practicality of actually doing something like this, of sort of creating sustainable living oneself, and self-sufficiency. Um, and if they were to do that, I think this is the book you might want to look at, or there are many others like it, The Complete Book of Self-Sufficiency, by a man called John Seymour. I want to read a bit from him of what he said. He said, self-sufficiency does not mean going back to the acceptance of a lower standard of living. On the contrary, self-sufficiency is the striving for a higher standard of living, for food which is fresh, organically grown, good, for the good life in pleasant surroundings, for the health of body and peace of mind, which comes with hard, varied work in the open air, and for the satisfaction that comes from doing difficult and intricate jobs well and successfully. Well, you can read more of this in my book, Education for Inevitable, and you, you might wonder why I'm giving copies of this away. The reason is it doesn't sell. <laughs> and, whoops, I thought I knocked that thing. Um, it doesn't sell because I think the publishers did a wonderful job in producing. It looks really grand, sort of hardback and so on. And they priced it right out of the market. It should have been a sort of a paperback for a fiver. Instead, it, it goes at a ridiculous price. And so they recently said to me, we're not selling your book. Uh, we need to get rid of them. Should we pulp them? And I said, no, you send them to me. And so <laughs> I have a lot of copies in my garage, and I've sent some to Sarah sort of, for, for distribution here. So it's not really a giveaway. It's just sort of you know, trying to clear my garage a bit. <laughs> Um, I think we ought to just have a look at this. Uh, I, I love this cartoonist, Ross Asquith. You know, I don't know whether you can read it, perhaps I had. If Gove's new curriculum is so great, why doesn't he make his precious academies follow it? Be fair, Daddy. Maybe they didn't teach logic in his day. <laughs> I believe that rethinking primary, secondary and teacher education along the lines that I've been looking at uh, would help to change us from a me-first society to one based on the togetherness of communities. It would help develop self-reliance in communities and the recognition that communities can act to resolve problems themselves rather than expect the state to do so. I believe these ideas would provide a better education for our young people than the present test-driven schooling that sees the economy as the prime goal for education and fails to recognize the coming challenge from ecology. And I commend these ideas to as worthwhile ideas in their own right, but as a preparation for whatever climatic decisions, climatic disasters, climatic disasters lie ahead as the earth warms up. There will be some among you, perhaps, who in your own classroom have fire in your belly. I guess most teachers in one way or another have what we might call fire in the belly, meaning putting enthusiasm, excitement, challenge into your teaching. May I urge you to look into the future. Recognize that today's demands on schools are quite inadequate for the challenges of the future and take the fire in your belly beyond your classroom uh, to demand change in the national system. I urge you to fight, and fight to win for a better future for those whom you teach. Being in my 80s, and having once, as Sarah said, been called the ringleader of um, bad, bad uh, academia, Michael Gove called us the blob, um, I sometimes turned to John of Gaunt's 
dying speech in Shakespeare's Richard II. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, that was wont to conquer others, hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Ah, oh, would the scandal vanish with my life. How happy then were my ensuing death. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.